Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Bible Study Podcast. I am your host, Sarah, and today is Sunday, October 29th, also known as Reformation Sunday in many Protestant churches. So Reformation Sunday is the Sunday before October 31st, and most people just think of October 31st as Halloween, right? But for many Protestants, especially Lutherans, we think of October 31st as Reformation Day, the anniversary of the Reformation, because that is the day that Martin Luther, for whom the Lutheran Church is named, nailed his 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg. And this year is a an extremely special year because this marks the 500th anniversary of that event. So 1517, Luther nailed the 90, his 95 theses to the church door. So since it is Reformation and... I am a Lutheran. I thought I would talk some first about Martin Luther and his life and what led to that event that we now know as the Reformation and give a little background on him before we look at some of the texts for today. So Martin Luther is, well, he was a very interesting person for a lot of reasons. First off, if you read his writings, he had some very creative slurs that he used against people. He liked to insult people by calling them like donkeys and pigs and just really interesting ways of describing people, especially the Pope who, after he was excommunicated, he had a very contentious relationship with. So he, he tended to write and call things and call the Pope names that were not terribly nice. At any rate, Martin Luther grew up in what is now Germany. He was supposed to be a lawyer. His parents wanted him to be a lawyer, and he was actually going to school to become a lawyer. And he was going back to school one day when he was caught in a terrible, terrible thunderstorm. And as he was taking refuge, hoping not to be killed in this thunderstorm, thunder, the lightning flashing everywhere, he did as so many people have been known to do, and he made a bargain with God. He told God that if he was to get out of this storm alive, he would stop going to law school and he would become a monk. So he did, in fact, get out of that storm alive, and he was good to his word. He actually did go and become a monk, much to his parents' dismay because they had wanted their son, as I said, to be a lawyer. Um, monks, you know, don't really make a living. <laughs> they don't make them a lot of money. So it was a little disappointing. So Martin Luther, of course, is a Catholic monk, Catholicism being the main religion at the time. And he threw himself into it. He studied, he worked hard, but Martin Luther never did anything halfway. And confession was one of those things. So he would go to confession and he would spend from what it sounds like, just hours in the confessional confessing every known and possible sin that he could think of, just trying to get that off of his conscience, trying to find that peace that confession was supposed to bring. And he he wrote that he could leave the confessional and not have even begun his penance, just walk out of the confessional and already begin to think of things that he should have said in confession. So he spent a lot of time, an exorbitant amount of time going to confession. Fortunately, he had a very understanding confessor and mentor who 
decided he needed to try to shift his focus. And so he suggested that Martin Luther become a professor and start studying theology. And so that's what Martin Luther did. He started studying, and it was actually during this, the course of his studies that he began to read the book of Romans. And it is in the book of Romans where he discovered what Paul writes, maybe not discovered, but he really resonated with and read in a new light what Paul writes about faith and grace, that we are justified by grace, not by works. And so this is what he had been looking for. He had been trying to find that perfect solution, the perfect thing that he could do And he had been trying confession to feel as though he deserved God's love and God's forgiveness. And when he read this book of Romans, a light bulb came on and he realized he didn't have to do anything to deserve God's love. That had already been done for him by Christ through the crucifixion and the resurrection and that we have been given grace. We've been justified by grace, not by the act that we do. And this really, really changed his perception. And it's not as though he just up and left the Catholic church. Boom. That was it. He had this revelation and he was done. No, he actually didn't want to leave the Catholic church. He just wanted to reform it. Hence we get the word reformation, right? So as he studied more and he started learning more and thinking more about this idea that had given him so much comfort, he wrote out these theses, theses being arguments or points of debate. And it was actually not really an act of like aggression or anything when he nailed that list of 95 things that he wanted to see discussed within Catholicism. It he, it wasn't that weird to nail that to the church door. The church door was actually kind of a communal bulletin board. So it's not like he was defacing the church door or, or anything. He was just putting up this list because he wanted to start a conversation. He wanted people to think about things in different ways, especially church leaders, priests, monks, uh, cardinals, whatever it might be, and maybe make some changes in the church. He wanted some reform to happen. Well, it didn't really work out that way. (laughs) And long story short, he wasn't immediately excommunicated. It's not like he immediately stopped being Catholic. Again, this is all much more complicated than I'm giving you in this very brief history. But Eventually, he was excommunicated. He did have to go into hiding at one point because he was afraid for his life. He had a very interesting life, but he eventually left the Catholic Church. He was excommunicated from the Catholic Church, and he didn't want either to start a new church. He certainly didn't want it named after him, but he he drew followers who wanted to hear what he had to say, who liked and agreed with what he had to say, who themselves had been feeling as though the church hadn't really been meeting their needs. And so they started having those conversations. And it was actually while Martin Luther was in hiding that he started translating the Bible into German. Up until that point, the Bible was only in Latin. So common people who weren't educated in Latin couldn't read it for themselves. They had to rely solely on the priests to interpret the Bible for them. They couldn't read it for themselves and come to their own conclusions about it. They simply had to rely on what the priests were telling them and have faith that they were being told what the Bible truly said. So Martin Luther decided that everyone should be able to read the Bible in his or her own language. And since he was German, he he began translating it into German, which is a huge task. The other thing that happened at this time was the Gutenberg printing press. And It wasn't actually the invention of the printing press. It was the invention of movable type. So instead of having to carve a plate for each page that you were going to print, which was extraordinarily time consuming, Gutenberg invented movable type so that you could redo each page in a much quicker amount of time. So that meant printing suddenly became faster and less expensive, meaning that more people could afford to buy books, meaning more people could afford to buy the Bible. 
in German. They could actually read the Bible for themselves. So Martin Luther was studying, he was translating the Bible, he was doing all these things, he was writing all of these treatises and his, he was writing Bible studies. He was also writing, you know, inflammatory letters about the Pope, but (laughs) yeah. And he unfortunately had some really horrible things to say about the Jewish people of his community, um, which is something that unfortunately we have had to regret for 500 years and we could blame it on the times, but no, we just have to be extraordinarily sad that our beloved leader would be that close-minded you know when he when he wanted to change his own church and to find new ways of thinking he he still couldn't see the jewish people around him as children of god so unfortunately that is an extremely unfortunate part of our past especially considering that the nazi party used those writings in some of their justification for what they did during the holocaust not the nicest part of the Reformation story. At any rate, there were a lot of good things as well. Uh, You know, getting the Bible into the hands of common people. He did eventually marry. He married uh, Katerina von Bora, who was a nun at one point. So we have a monk and a nun who got married. They had six children together. And I think my favorite thing about Katie Luther is that she brewed beer. So, hey, Lutherans like their beer. Um, At least least some of us do. I'm not a beer drinker myself, but not because, it's just because I don't like the taste of it. But Katie Luther was a remarkable woman in her own right. And at any rate, Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses to the door of the church on October 31st, 1517. And that was what we now consider to be the beginning of the Reformation. And of course, it wasn't just Martin Luther. These ideas started taking off in other ways. The Reformation began spreading. People began also breaking away from the Catholic Church and and talking about the Bible and and translating the Bible into their own languages, etc., And so it just spiraled, and that was what the Reformation as a whole, of course, refers to. And it was a very interesting time. It was probably a very scary time. One thing about the Reformation is that, unfortunately, it was not great for women. Something that isn't always well known is that in trying to break away from Catholicism and all of its ideas, first off, many amazing works of art were destroyed because they chose they didn't want icons or any images in the churches so there were a lot of really amazing works of art that were destroyed because of that but also at this point you know women didn't really have any rights your choices in life were to get married pretty much or get married uh, you could the only the only thing that you could do was become a nun and receive education and go on a different path. That was one way that you could become educated. You could hold a little bit of a position of power in the community. And one thing that the Reformation did was to um, disband all monasteries, all um, convents. And so unfortunately, the Reformation was not good for women in that way. It took away their only other option to marriage. So Not everything is great about the Reformation, but a lot of good things did come out of it. I like everything. There's the pros and the cons that have to be held in balance with with each other. And it's important to understand kind of the whole picture of that. So that is your extraordinarily brief summary of Martin Luther and the Reformation. One quick aside is that when I talk to children on Reformation Sunday during the children's sermon, I started taking two pictures with me because when I would say this is Reformation Sunday, et cetera, et cetera, do you know who Martin Luther is? Some child would always raise their hand and be so excited. Oh, 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 Martin Luther, Martin Luther. I know who that was. He was black and he led the civil rights movement. (laughs) And so I would always bring two pictures. I would say, now you're thinking of Martin Luther King And I'd hold up the picture of Martin Luther King Jr. And we'd talk about that really briefly. And then I'd hold up the picture of Martin Luther and say, this is Martin Luther for whom Martin Luther King was named. 
And so that's just my quick aside, something that I, I always tended to do because it never failed, never failed. That always came up. And so the visuals helped to maybe hopefully clear up some of that confusion. So we are going to take our first break of the podcast now. But when we come back, we'll be looking at the Old Testament text assigned for this Sunday. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. You're listening to the GSMC Bible Study Podcast. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. And we're back with the GSMC Bible Study Podcast. We are now going to talk about the texts assigned for this Reformation Sunday, October 29th. And these are different texts than you would hear if you were in a church that was not celebrating Reformation Sunday. Then you would hear the texts for the regularly assigned um Pentecost Sunday, as we normally have been doing, but there are special special texts, excuse me, assigned for Reformation Sunday. So let's look at those. The first one, of course, is our Old Testament text, and this week that comes to us from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Again, that is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. And for me, at least, it seems these verses just make sense to be assigned for Reformation Sunday. As I was speaking about before the break, talking about Martin Luther and the struggles he had with his own faith, this really is outlining what he came to know then as justification by grace. Because this is saying that God is going to create a new covenant. And of course, God has created covenants before. That's what we've been talking about with those alternate readings during the season of Pentecost, looking at God working through different people's lives in those Old Testament stories. And now God is saying, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. He says, it won't be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt a covenant that they broke. So this is the thing. God keeps trying. God keeps making new covenants with the people and the people keep not upholding their own ends of those covenants, right? Because they're human. They aren't perfect. They make mistakes. You've heard me say it a million times. So, but God keeps trying. God keeps coming back and saying, okay, that one was broken. Let's try something else. And so this is kind of foreshadowing then what's going to happen. And we say that at the right time, then Jesus came into the world, became incarnate, and through his life, death, and resurrection, we have received this new covenant, one that isn't reliant upon us as imperfect humans. It is reliant on the fact that Jesus did come to earth as a human being, did give himself up 
to be crucified and then was raised from the dead and has given us this amazing gift of eternal life, of living eternally in that covenant with God. That is what Martin Luther found so reassuring about Romans, is that there's nothing we can do to earn that love. There's nothing we can do to lose that love. That, of course, doesn't mean that we don't do anything. Of course, we still look to all of those commandments in the Bible that tell us to love our neighbor, that tell us how to love our neighbor. All of those covenant, all those commandments, excuse me, give us ways to live in relationship with each other because living in relationship with God means, of course, we want to be in relationship with all the rest of God's children. How could we not want to share the love that has been given to us with the people around us? And of course, being the imperfect humans that we are, we make up all kinds of reasons for why we can't love the people around us. But, you know, that is kind of the, 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 the hope of that covenant is that because God loves us so fiercely, we won't be able to help but give that love to others. So God is saying, I will make a new covenant. And then there's this part later on in chapter, or in, excuse me, in verse 32, when God says, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. I love this. God is going to write God's word on our hearts so that it is within us. It is an intrinsic part of us. We can't exist without it because it is within us. And whenever I read phrases like this, I, I can't help but think of my Old Testament professor in seminary. And I've talked to you about him before, Dr. James Lindbergh. And he would always he would always ask, now, does this literally mean God's going to take a pen and write it on our hearts? He never actually said that phrase to us, but I can imagine him saying it. No, it's a metaphor. He loved to say it's a metaphor, but it it's a beautiful metaphor, right? I mean, if you don't take it literally and think, oh dear, ick, something in my heart, gross. No, it means that it is within us. And of course, we see the heart in our society as this source of love. And ancient people saw the heart as kind of source of wisdom and knowledge, but both make equal sense as to why God would put that within our hearts, the place where we store knowledge or love or what have you. And then it's just going to be a part of us. We don't have to try to figure out how to know the Lord because God's word will be inside of us. And God says, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And that is what brings us comfort from this verse. God forgives us. God remembers our sin no more. Our slate is wiped clean because of grace. And I just find this incredibly beautiful and incredibly comforting. And I do want to look at some commentary on this text. And this commentary tells us a little bit about Reformation Sunday. It says, Reformation Sunday draws our attention to God's ongoing work of renewal in the church to the unmerited gift of divine grace that cannot be bought or sold, and to a history of courageous response to that free gift, embodied in reformers who have been willing to challenge abuses within the body of Christ. And this commentary comes from Anathia Portier Young, who is Associate Professor of Old Testament at Duke Divinity School in Durham, North Carolina. And so she starts out with a little bit of why we're reading this, you know, what Reformation Sunday draws our attention to, and that's God's ongoing work of renewal. She says that Jeremiah's declaration of God's renewed covenant, enfleshed within the very guts of God's people and written on their hearts, surprises with visceral and vital imagery of intimate knowing and belonging. God says, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. She asks the question, so what will it mean for the people of God to carry the law within their bodies? God's own will and teaching will become their electromagnetic signature radiating from within 
setting the rhythm for all that they do. She asks the question, so what do we know about our hearts? What do you know about your heart? I'm sure you probably studied it somewhere in elementary school, in junior high, in high school. I remember studying it at various levels about how our blood is pumped by our heart, how our heart is this very powerful muscle that pumps the blood throughout our body. And if you think how far our toes are away from our heart, especially if you're really, really tall, it's a long way, right? The pump, the heart has to be an incredible muscle in order to get the, the blood to the body and to all of the places that it needs to go, taking oxygen and vital nutrients everywhere throughout the body. We need these to, of course, live and thrive. And she says, with each beat, blood returns to the heart so that it may be pumped through the lungs to be filled with oxygen once more. So, of course, our heart's beating is the pulse of life within us. And then she says, the ancient Israelites understood the heart as a faculty. They knew the heart as the seat of will, invention, reasoning, discernment, and judgment. In 1 Kings, when Solomon asks God for an understanding mind, able to discern between good and evil, he is requested in the first phrase, a hearing heart. Later, God's gift to Solomon is described as very great wisdom, discernment, and breadth of understanding. In Hebrew, the last phrase means wideness of heart. So breadth of understanding means wideness of heart. And these metaphors empathize the capacity to receive, respond, grow, and hold a wisdom that only God can give. So like I was saying earlier, even as we see our hearts now as the center of, you know, love and affection, or if you see it in this older sense of sense of reasoning and wisdom, etc., it still gives us this wonderful meta metaphor of how love and wisdom of a certain kind can only come from God. She says that the people of Israel also understood the heart's powerful link to emotion. Earlier in the book of Jeremiah, his prophetic world ex word exploded from the painful awareness of his heart's response to the distress of his people. My anguish, my anguish, I writhe in pain. Oh, the walls of my heart, my heart is beating wildly. I cannot keep silent, for I hear the sound of trumpet, the alarm of war. That's Jeremiah 4.19. And we have been reading through a lot of Jeremiah in the last few weeks, and Jeremiah really was, oh, he was he was so in pain by so many things in his life. On another occasion, the prophet declared that he ate God's word, and they became God's words, and they became the delight of his heart. That's in chapter 15, verse 16. And later still, Jeremiah confesses that God's word rages in his heart like a fire. So there's all this talk about about hearts and what it means metaphorically, what it what it brings to us. So she says, Jeremiah uses that word, the word in Hebrew that's trans the words in Hebrew that are translated as heart, sixty five times in all, more frequently than it does any book of the Hebrew Bible, apart from Psalms and Proverbs. This prominence, she says, highlights an important theme in Jeremiah, namely the embodied awareness, thoughts, disposition, choices, and actions of God's people. Their hearts embody their intentions, guilt, and punishment. When God's will, when God will, excuse me, she says, when God will write God's law upon the hearts of the people, their hearts will embody and empower the true relationship they share with God and one another. The relationship will be characterized by a deep and abiding knowledge of God's will and by an intimacy that defines each in relationship to the other. So here again, we have this context of covenant. God promises, God's promise accompanies the command that all of these covenants will be fulfilled so we have this understanding, this new understanding. God's writing a new covenant and God's giving us a new way of understanding it, right? By putting it within the very heart of our being, if you'll pardon what may sound like a pun, but 
it's not. It is, but it's not. It's a play on words, right? Putting it within the very heart of us, within the very heart of ourselves, our being, so that no matter what happens, whether we're thinking with our heart, whether we're feeling emotion with our heart, whether we're reasoning with our heart, however you look at that metaphor, we should be doing it from the base and the context of God's love and God's con- God's covenant, excuse me. And God's love is based in the promises of the resurrection as we understand it. So there you go. Pretty amazing. If you base your life on that, on God's word, God's covenant being the very heart of you, the very fundamental essence of you, just think how if we all lived that way, as though we could actually perceive that heart of us being God's will and God's covenant, and then sharing that love, sharing God's covenant with everyone we meet. Pretty impressive. We do have to take our second break of the podcast, but when we come back, we'll be looking at the psalm assigned for this week. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Bible Study Podcast. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Bible Study Podcast. We are talking this week about the assigned lectionary texts for the uh, for Reformation Sunday. Reformation, as I have mentioned, is actually on October 31st, so we celebrate it the Sunday before. We have talked a little bit about the history of Reformation, and then in the last segment we talked about the reading from Jeremiah assigned for this week. So now we're going to move on to the psalm that is assigned for this week, and it is Psalm 46, which is as follows. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. So again, that is Psalm 46. And for me, as a lifelong Lutheran, when I hear Psalm 46, verse 1, God is our strength, our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The first thing that my mind goes to is the hymn written by Martin Luther, which we sing on Reformation Sunday, called A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And the first verse, at least, A mighty fortress is our God, a sword and shield victorious. He breaks the cruel oppressor's rod and wins salvation glorious. The old satanic foe has sworn to work us woe. With craft and dreadful might, he arms himself to fight. 
on earth he has no equal. And if that sounds vaguely familiar, there are two different tunes that go with it. And some people are more familiar with one tune. Some people are more familiar with the other tune. And when I try to sing the one that I'm not more familiar with, then it just feels weird. But the one that I grew up singing is actually, it's awesome. Martin Luther wrote the words based on Psalm 46, and he used a drinking song for the tune. So the tune is... Uh, and I don't know if I know the tune that's the drinking song or if it's the less familiar tune to me that's the drinking song. I apologize that I don't know that. But the one I know is, A mighty fortress is our God, a sword and shield victorious. He breaks the cruel oppressor's rod and wins salvation glorious. And I won't, ta I won't torment you anymore with my a cappella singing, but um, I, my throat's all scratchy and y you just don't need to hear that. But just so you know what the tune is a little bit, uh, in case it is familiar to you, or maybe now you're thinking, I thought I knew it, and then that crazy lady started singing it, and I have no idea what song that is. But anyway, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, the hymn that I was just talking about. According to uh, one commentary I was reading this week from Rolf Jacobson, he says, according to Ulrich Leupold, the hymn is... Um, is more more than any other epitomizes Luther's thought and personal experience, and it is a rather free paraphrase of Psalm 46. You know, it's not exact, but it, it's a paraphrase, and so you can understand why, obviously, Lutherans at least, and maybe some others, sing this on Reformation Sunday. So it is obviously a sign. Many churches sing it on Refor bleh, Reformation Sunday. But Leupold also notes, according to Jacobson, that Luther did not write this hymn to express his own feelings, but to interpret and apply the 46th Psalm to the church of his own time and its struggles. This is a fine summary to interpret the, the text and apply them to our own time and struggles. So what does Psalm 46 have to tell us, really? So uh, Jacobson says that the psalm the text of the psalm is composed into three verse-long stanzas and two refrains. So stanza one, verses one through three, stanza two, verses four through six, then the refrain, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, that's verse seven, which is repeated in verse 11, and between that is stanza three, verses eight through 10. So, um, he says an important note about the text of the psalm is necessary because some recent modern editions of the book of Psalm uh, restored, and he put that in quotes and then in parentheses, he says that's a fancy scholarly term meaning fussed with. <laughs> um, I love his commentaries. He makes me smile. Uh, so some recent modern editions of this book, the book of Psalms, fussed with the text of the psalm to include the psalm's refrain after the first stanza also. So instead of having stanza one, stanza two refrain, stanza three refrain, they stuck it back in there in stanza one. So that's not actually accurate to the original. But um, so if you see that, it's not like the end of the world, but just know that they, they kind of fussed with that to make it more of a stanza and refrain call and response kind of thing. But um. He says, just be aware when you're reading through and you see that, that it's not necessarily the original. So he says, stanza one, the roaring of creation and God, our refuge. And I love that Luther describes it as a mighty fortress. God is a mighty fortress. And you can picture, I always picture like a huge castle uh, on a cliff, well defended, just kind of standing there through the tests of time and weather and invading armies and whatever it might be, God as that strong bulwark. But when I read, when I think of the hymn, that's what I think of, the mighty fortress. When I think of God as our refuge, I think a little more, I think of a softer image as opposed to that, that 
mighty fortress on the cliff. When I think of God as our refuge, I think of God taking me in God's arms, surrounding me with not only protection, but with love and with comfort. And that to me, so it, you know, it's still, it's still a refuge. It's still protection. It's just a slightly softer version of that big impenetrable castle that I picture when I think of a mighty fortress. So Jacobson says that uh, this image of God as our refuge is a reminder that the fallen condition of creation, you know, our sinfulness goes beyond mere human disobedience. He says the image of the earth shaking and the sea roaring is one of creation itself in rebellion against God's creative disorder, uh, God's creative order. Excuse me. He says the fallen condition encompasses all creation, all of nature. Thus, the law that the psalm names is the reality that creation itself is broken and in rebellion against the creator. Death wait, awaits all. And then the good news that the psalm names is the one trustworthy source of security that can be relied on in the midst of this rebellion, this roaring rebellion, he says. Obviously, that's that first verse. God is our refuge, a very present help in times of trouble. And therefore, we shouldn't fear. This is similar to other psalms of trust, such as Psalm 23, when we are told over and over, not only in the psalms, but throughout the Bible, not to fear. So that is stanza one, the roaring of creation and God our refuge. Uh, Jacobson names stanza two as the roaring of the nations and the river of God. So the second stanza intensifies both the threat that is named and the promise that is proffered. Whereas the first stanza remains, he says, at a more universal level, naming a universal threat of creation in rebellion and offering sort of a general promise of God as refuge. Now, this second stanza is really focusing more specifically on the national identity of God's chosen people. So it refers to the nations and those nations that threaten the city of God. So the refrain then employs the personal name of the Lord, as well as the uh, reference to the God of Jacob, a reference to the nation's ancestral patriarch. So all of this is basically to say that the, the psalm is intensifying and the sense of threat has gone from general kind of all creation to um, more specific in terms of national threats. So empires such as Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, even many smaller nations who posed threats to Israel's existence. So this intensification, he says, of the naming of the threat also balances that first stanza by naming a second more particular and more direct way in which the fallen condition of sin affects human humanity, and that's through our human sin. So you can see as we're moving through these stanzas that we are, you know, the, things are progressing, things are intensifying. Then you get the refrain, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. It's reiterated. We don't need to fear. God is with us. God is in the presence of the people. And God's presence is metaphorically described as a river whose streams make glad the city of God. So there, there isn't a river in Jerusalem. and There wasn't then, there isn't now. So this is a metaphor. And the point, he says, is that the point is rather the powerful promise resident in the stark image of the refreshing and life-sustaining river to a city and people in an arid climate under siege by an invading army. So you get this image of the river kind of bringing this amazing gift to a people who are under siege. So then um, stanza three, he names, be still and know that I am God. And that is one of of that that's a very very well known verse right you see that often written be still and know that i am god be still and know that i am be still and know 
be still. I see that all the time. But for me, I think the most powerful way is to be still and know that I am God. In other words, uh, not to be too, not to put too fine a point on it, but shut up <laughs> and pay attention. Uh, I know you're scared. I know you're worried. I know there's all this stuff going on, but I am God and I am here and I am your refuge. This is the promise that God speaks in the end. Be still and know that I am God. He says, Jacobson says, to know in Hebrew does not mean just to acknowledge something intellectually, but to internalize or to embody that truth fully. So again, we go back to what we are talking about with the Old Testament lesson from Jeremiah. When God's word is written on our very beings, on our hearts, on our souls, we have internalized this knowledge. Don't be afraid. Be calm. Be still. Know that I am God. This was comforting to the people in terms of generic kind of threats of rebellion against God to specific threats of national threats against Israel. But it's also a reminder to us of that promise that God makes with us, of the covenants that God makes with us. And we are reminded to not just be still, which is a good thing to be sometimes. We all need to take those moments. But not only to be still, but to know that God is God, to know that God is our refuge, our strength, our very present time in our very present help in time of trouble. God is our refuge. Whether you picture that as that giant castle, formidable on a cliff, well defended, hard to get to, or whether you picture it in a little more softer way, God's arms wrapped around you, protecting you, loving you, caring for you. Be still and know that I am God. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. We are going to take another break, but when we come back, we'll be moving to the New Testament and talking about the first assigned New Testament text. So stay tuned and we will be right back with the GSMC Bible Study Podcast. Still on the search of that one true love? On the limbo in this crazy world of dating, marriage, relationships. Well, Listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Relationship Podcast, your one-stop podcast for everything about relationships. Welcome back to the GSMC Bible Study Podcast. Again, we are talking about the a text, the texts assigned for Reformation Sunday. We've covered the history of Re- the Reformation, the text from Jeremiah, and the text from Psalm 46. And now we move to the New Testament. And understandably enough, the New Testament text comes to us from the book of Romans, which if you were um, listening, paying attention to that first section with the history, then you know that it was in the book of Romans that Luther really found his idea or he, where he found his, his own refuge, if you will, his own sense of, of God's grace through faith, but we are justified by grace through faith. So this, the old, ah, excuse me, geez, the new Testament text comes to us from the book of Romans chapter three, verses 19 through 28. Now, we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed, and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, 
whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous, and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. And again, that is Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 28. And the more I read that, the more I see it as Martin Luther saw it when you are in, it depends on the church that you go to, but it happens at various ages. You go through a process of confirmation and not all churches do this, but in the Lutheran church, if you are baptized as an infant, those baptismal promises are made to you, made for you by your parents, by your godparents, um, etc., by the congregation as a whole. So when you're a little older, maybe around middle school age, depending on the church that you go to, then you go through what's called confirmation or the affirmation of baptism, where now that you are older, you can make those promises for yourself. You've already been baptized, so you don't need to be baptized again. You affirm your baptism. You confirm those promises made to you. And it can be a two to three year program where you study you study the Old Testament, the New Testament, you study Luther's small catechism where he talks about the creeds and the Lord's Prayer. And so it's this process where you learn not only what it means to what Lutheran doctrine is about, but you learn about the Old and the New Testament. And I don't, I mean, it was, it's, it's drilled into your head. We are justified by grace through faith, justified by grace through faith. Yeah. Okay. And you memorize it because you have to. <laughs> But as I get older and I read it more, as I was reading through it this time, it's just, it never ceases to amaze me. I can see why that would have brought Luther such comfort. He says, because, you know, what becomes of boasting? Well, it's excluded. And by what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. And he says that this is the righteousness of God through faith, Paul says, in Jesus Christ. There is no distinction since we have all sinned. There is no one who can say that they haven't sinned. No one is perfect. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. None of us, if you think about it, really deserves the love that God has given us. None of us deserves God, this God who continually tries to be in relationship with us, who continually renews those covenants, who eventually sent God's own son into the world to fulfill those promises. None of us are ever, ever going to be good enough to live up to those promises. And none of us ever have to be good enough to live up to those promises. Those promises have been made. Those promises were given to us at baptism. We affirm those in our affirmation of baptism, in our confirmation of those promises. And your tradition, you know, those things are given to you at baptism, no matter what age you are baptized. You are made a child of God, whether you deserve it or not, whether you understand it or not, whether it makes sense, because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical that God would love us this much. It's just not logical. We screw up all the time. We hurt each other. We do horrible things. We lie. We we put ourselves first. We don't pay attention to our neighbors. We make up excuses for why we don't like people. We justify things in all kinds of ways. We, we aren't perfect. And even when we're trying so hard to be perfect, we never are because we're human and we fall short. We're not God. That's, that's part of, that's kind of the point, right? We're never going to be God. So we're never going to be perfect. And that might sound discouraging. You might, a lot of people don't like to talk about sin because, you know, they're, they're, I'm a good person. They, they want to be a, seen as a good person. They don't want to be seen as broken or a sinner. But for me, you know, I'm a perfectionist. I've said that before, but for me, 
that's so comforting. That is just so comforting because even though I still strive for perfection and in certain ways, you know, I want to do things right. I want to learn new things and get them right the first time, whatever it is. I, I want people to think I'm a good person. At the end of the day, when I fail in some way, and I'm usually harder on myself than other people are, but still, it is so comforting to know that God loves me no matter what, whether I'm perfect that day, whether I totally screwed up in some way, whether I lost my temper and said something that I shouldn't have, whatever it is, God forgives me. And that gives me the space to try again. That gives me the space to go back out into the world with the love that God has given me to share that with my brothers and sisters in Christ, to go back out into the world and find that person with whom I lost my temper and say, I am so sorry. I screwed up. Can you forgive me? Knowing that God's promises are there for me regardless. It's not cheap grace. Some people, there's uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes a lot about the difference between cheap grace and costly grace. It's not that we just go do whatever we want because God's going to love us anyway. No. Jesus fulfilled the promises of God. Jesus's death and resurrection fulfilled those promises. It's very costly grace, right? In terms of the price that Jesus paid for us. So we need to honor that. We don't just get to sin and do whatever we want. It's that even when we sin, God still loves us. So this text is near and dear to my heart. It, um, it gets deeper every time I read it. It, it gives me comfort and it is a definite, uh, there's, there's a definite, a very definite reason that we read it on Reformation Sunday. And, um, you maybe saw that reasoning as we were talking about that text. So we're going to take one more break and come back for the last segment of the podcast where we will look at the gospel reading. So stay tuned and we will be right back with the GSMC po Bible study podcast. Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Welcome back to this final segment of the GSMC Bible Study Podcast. It is Reformation Sunday. We are talking about the texts assigned, and we are now up to that final text, which comes to us this week from the Gospel of John, and it is chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, anyone who commits a sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Again, that's the Gospel of John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. And the thing that jumps out at me every single time I read this text, and you would think that it wouldn't still surprise me, but it still just, it still makes me pause every time I see this, this verse where they say, we are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What? <laughs> Oh, that gift of denial, right? Of course you were slaves. You were slaves in Egypt. Do you not remember that entire story of the Passover that you do every year where God brings you out, uses Moses to bring you out of slavery, brings you through the wilderness to the promised land? Come on, people. Yes, you are descendants of Abraham. Yes, you are God's chosen people. Yes, you are children of God. But what do you mean you've never been slaves to anyone? 
Oy, it just makes me roll my eyes every time. But Jesus, so Jesus is talking to them. And, um, you know, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Now, when I read that, I realize that it's not at all said about Martin Luther because it's not as though Jesus is speaking 1500 years before the fact and saying, Hey, one day this guy is going to realize something and it's going to be amazing. But this really is what happened for Martin Luther, right? He read something that he realized was the truth about God's love for him and about God's love for everyone. And that truth really did make him free. It set him free from that guilt and that doubt that he had been carrying around with him for so long. It gave him a new perspective on the world, on God, on his relationship with God, on his faith, on so many different things, you know, and because of that, his life took a massive turn as things that he never expected to happen happened, right? I mean, he, he started a reformation. He just, he started a whole new direction that the church went in. And so he heard that truth and the truth really helped to free him from his his guilt and his doubt. And that is a lot of what I was talking about in the last segment when I hear those words and they just, they keep becoming more and more meaningful to me as I go through my life, as things get harder throughout life, get more complicated, whatever it is, as I continue to try to navigate relationships as, um, you know, you continue to grow and evolve hopefully as you go through life. But sometimes, Sometimes it's so frustrating when you feel like you just have had the worst day and you, you know, you think you're doing better and then suddenly you screw up and you say something stupid or you do something stupid and you you backslide and think I, ah, right. But then you hear some, you know, the voice of God comes to you in some way. Maybe it's through the voice of a friend or maybe you are reading scripture or maybe you, listening to music that you love and the voice of God is there telling you that truth of God's love. You are a child of God. You are my beloved child. I love you and I've given you these promises. And then that truth sets you free to go back out into the world and try again. To go back out knowing that you're not perfect and you're probably going to screw up again, but to go out and do your very best to share God's love with everyone that you meet because God has given it to you first. And what more can you do with that amazing gift than to share it with everyone? And so Jesus goes on to say, you know, very truly, I tell you, everyone commits who commits sin is a slave to sin. Well, everyone commits sin, right? So we're all slaves to sin. We cannot get free from sin by ourselves. We just can't. But He says, the slave does not have a permanent place in the household, but the son has a place there forever. And Jesus, of course, is the son, right? So if the son makes you free, if Jesus, through God's covenant, through the promises of Jesus's life, death and resurrection, makes you free, you will be free indeed. You will be be free indeed. You will be given God's love. You will be reminded of the grace that God has given you, and you will be able to take that grace and go into the world and show God's love in hopefully to everyone you meet. And I could keep going, but I really don't want to just keep, I mean, I could just keep repeating that because for myself, I sometimes need to hear it over and over again, but doesn't probably make for the best podcast. So I am just going to leave that there. Uh, If the sun makes you free, you will be free indeed. We are justified by grace through faith. We are God's beloved children. And really that is what, yes, we celebrate the history of the Reformation on this Sunday. We talk about Martin Luther and the courage it took for him to stand up for what he believed in. But we really celebrate what brought him to that place in order where he was courageous. And that was this idea that God loves us no matter what. And there's nothing that we can do that will cause us 
to lose that love. Just like there's nothing we can do to earn that love. So I want to thank you for joining me as we discuss these texts assigned for Reformation Sunday. I hope you will join me again next Sunday when we will be looking at the text assigned for All Saints Day. That will be next week's podcast. In the meantime, you can find all of our podcasts at www.gsmcpodcast.com. You can download those podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, any app that you use for your mobile device. And we do have 20 different podcasts in our family of podcasts. So go check them out. See if there's something else that you want to listen to. And we would love it. We'd also love to hear from you on social media if that is your thing. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram. And I would love to hear from you on social media. Thank you again for joining me. Join me again next week for All Saints Sunday. In the meantime, remember, please remember that you are a beautiful and beloved child of God. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.